really for every one of our points. I've got a different scripture, but I won't uh, be real lengthy. But I want to share something with you. I was thinking about uh, how the year has been um, and how, you know, here another year has come and gone. And um, I have certain expectations, I guess, and goals I set personally in my life every year. And I'm sure y'all probably do the same thing and uh, things that you want to see happen. And sometimes you reach them and sometimes you don't. But you, I believe it's important to set goals. Um, but it's one thing to set a goal. I, I used to be bad about setting goals, but I didn't have a plan on how I was going to get there. And a lot of times we set goals and don't have a, a, a good plan to get to that. You know, you say, I want to I want to be here. Well, how do you want to start to get to that point? Uh, so it's good to have a, a plan uh, instead of just setting goals because you'll set a goal and it'll fizzle out pretty quick. I, I don't believe in New Year's resolutions, but just at the beginning of a new year, you I always think about, and, I, and especially spiritually, what's happened in my life the year prior and uh, to see and kind of do a self-evaluation. And I think that's a good thing to do, uh, you know, uh, because we all – any Christian, I was talking to a young man today at lunch and uh, was talking about the church and just the church in general, and uh, he grew up in church. His dad was a pastor for years, um, and some some good things about the church and some negative things about the church. And I told him, I said, that's one thing I love about my church. I said, I, I believe all those stereotypes and negativities that come along with the church, especially in, I guess we could say, in the Bible Belt, uh, to get rid of those stereotypes, if not for all of them, just for hours. You know, I said it's about, uh, to me, it's about getting closer to God and growing. You know, it's, it's a, that's such a personal battle and a, and a personal feat that really – you don't have time to worry about what everybody else is doing when you're trying to get there yourself. Now, me being a, a preacher, being your pastor, I give you what God gives me to help you to apply it to your life so you can take it and run with it farther. That's, I believe that's the job um, uh, of the preacher, to bring the message that God gives him to where hopefully it will help you in some way. And I hope I've done that in some aspects this year. But I really... I say it every year, but I would love to see a turning point. Um, just see more out of our church. And and, and I, I, like I said, I was doing a self-evaluation. Then I started evaluating the church, and we've seen people grow spiritually. And it ain't always about numbers. I know that. But you can be discouraged by looking at numbers if you're not careful. But I know that just from talking to some of you that you've grown spiritually, and that's that's what keeps me going. So I appreciate that. Uh, but I really want to see God move in a mighty way, man, this year. And uh, I've got personal things set in my own heart that I want to see come to fruition and things that I need to get right myself to see that take place, to be a good leader, to be uh, a, a, your pastor and be good at it and be better at it this next year than I was the year before because we're, you know, we're just learning as we go, you know. They don't have an apprenticeship for pastors. You just kind of learn on the job, amen. But anyway, so anyway, that's what a little thought I want to share with you that God gave me the other night. I want to share with you uh, today, even though the year is about up, the, the title, I guess, would be There's Still Time This Year. There's Still Time This Year. Second Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1 says, We, we then as workers together... With him beseech you, that means to beg you, also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. I, I like that. I got to looking at that. I read over that scripture several times to try to understand what Paul was saying there to the Corinthian church, that you receive the grace of God not in vain, meaning that you don't just receive it and say, well, I don't really realize why I, I received it or that it really didn't help me or anybody else by receiving the grace of God. 
Paul says, he says, I beg you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. He, and I believe what Paul was saying was, you need to do something with it. You don't need to just sit on it. It's just like anybody else. It's just like if you got saved and you never told anybody else about Jesus. You don't just sit on what God's done for you. That's where I believe in Paul is, I believe what he's saying here is everybody has a testimony. And if God has presented his grace to you and you are experience the grace of God, he says, I beg you that you didn't receive that in vain, that you do something with that. It's, it's action. The grace of God does something. It does something to us internally, and therefore it does something or shows something externally by being on the inside. And that's what Paul's saying. And I, I got to look at that. I read that several times, and I believe based on what I got out of it, especially the follow-up here uh, in the next verse, he's, uh, he's talking about as you've received the grace of God. And you know what that tells me too? That everybody has received the grace of God. Amen. He just automatically assumed the people he were talking to received the grace of God. Because he didn't say that if you do receive it. He said, when you, he said, I beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. He said, you're going to receive it, but don't receive it in vain. He said, I beg you that, that don't just stop with you. Amen. I believe that's what he's trying to tell us. He says in verse 2, he said, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So he was looking at it like it's not something you wait on. Once it's presented to you and God is dealing with you by his grace and mercy and his convicted hearts, convicted your heart, it's not something you wait on. And we all know that. This is a very familiar scripture, very familiar verse, but I never really read over it like that, especially the one before it. That, and another thing he's looking at, it. he said, he, he was looking at it like it's a waste for God to present his grace to you and you do nothing with it for yourself. It'd be like people that come under conviction and are never saved. What a waste. What a shame to receive. And I believe that's what, therefore, that's what he's saying there. He says, you receive the grace of God, not in vain. So when you get there to heaven and you stand before God one day, and God says, I presented you with the most love and grace humanly possible, and I gave that to you, and you did nothing with it. Paul said, I beg you that that's not the case with you. And, he, and then he goes on to say, so I believe he's talking about, especially in this scripture here, that he's talking about salvation. He says, don't receive it and just blow it off and do nothing with it. How many people we know have done that? What, what is, I always say this. I, I don't know how any of you all, I mean, I've heard some of your testimony. I don't know how any of y'all were convicted when you got saved or how it felt, the best way you know to describe. But I do know this. I know what I felt like. And I'll be real honest with you. I don't know how somebody can just ignore that. I really, I mean, I was under such a burden and such conviction that there's no, I don't see that there was a way for me to escape. That's, that's, the, that's, that's how I felt. I mean, just to be honest with you, which I know some people harden their heart. I hadn't hardened my heart. I wasn't looking to harden my heart. I wasn't looking for God. It just happened. As a matter of fact, what got me in the week that God saved me, I went to hear a preacher that my wife and my mama thought that I would really enjoy, and I did. I mean, a lot more than I thought that I was going to. And, uh, and the more he talked, the more I realized that God sent him to talk to me. And by Friday night of that revival, I knew who he was talking to. And I've told him after that, years after that, I said, God sent you there that week to talk to me. 
I said, God really convinced. I, I got a chance to talk to him and, and, and talk to him about my testimony, and not to in the depth that I'd like to, but I said, I, there was no doubt about it. I said, that God changed my life that week. That, you know, I've, ne I've never been the same. So I pray that I, I don't, I didn't receive, and I didn't that, I didn't receive it in vain. I've done something with it. But I believe it goes on even a little deeper, and Paul is, is saying, he's talking to the church here, to the Corinthian people, people that are believers. So I believe he can take it a little farther. He's also saying, when God convicts you to do something, don't just sit on that. Don't just blow it off. Don't receive it in vain. He said, I beg you that you don't do that. Because it's a serious thing, man. It's a serious thing. It's like people say, I've heard people say, well, just ignore it and it'll go away. Wow. That's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. That God took time out of everything he's involved in and everything he's done to deal with you one-on-one -on -one about anything. It's amazing. And just to blow it off, I don't. I just don't get that. And like I said, it just may be me, and people have the reasoning, but I don't know how you could ignore that. But Paul said, "Don't do it." So apparently, some people do, and and that's what's sad. But as I said, we are going to come into the end of the new year. There's only a few days left now until the new year arrives, and I was thinking about this last few days uh, all of life is a countdown every bit of it We're starting it's like there's always a countdown to something amen but uh, every moment saying and, and when you look at it like that every moment is important every every moment every, every waking moment that we have is important Many started this year probably like I did and, and some more, but have great expectations. Some are disappointed in what they've accomplished. And uh, some think that this has been a wasted year. But here's the good news. There's still time this year, whether you're here or watching by Facebook, there's still time to do something for God. First off, I want you to see, based on what this scripture shows us here, there's still time to be saved. Amen. I'm thankful for that. If you have breath in your body and you're hearing the sound of my voice in this message, there's still time for you to be saved. Paul said, now is the day of salvation. You are alive and therefore have time to be saved. You have time to admit you're a sinner. And Romans 3.23 tells us we've all sinned and come short of God's glory. You have time to believe that God loves you. So many people think they're unworthy and God don't love them. You have time to believe that Christ died for you. You have time to believe that Christ arose for you. And you have time to call on Christ in faith to be saved. Salvation takes place the moment, the moment we believe. It takes place. Acts chapter 16 Acts 16, verse 31, the, 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 the guard run in, sprang for a light and come in. He said, what must I do to be saved? At that moment, he was saved, I believe. Salvation is not complicated. All that is required is faith in Christ. It's belief. I've had so many people that I've, led to the Lord or prayed with or whatever, and they said, what do I have to do? I said, it's already been done. It's belief in him. Now, now I'm going to tell you something. You say, that's, that's pretty easy. You would think, but it's not. It, it, some people make it so complicated. Because it's one thing for you to tell me that you believe, but it's, it's, it's something that's a heart condition. Whether you do or not, it's on you. I've seen people that say they've been saved and come back later and say, I just don't know about that. So I don't know that they ever got it to start with. There's people in my family. And, and, and you know, so it's, it seems like they make it a whole lot harder to believe than what uh, we think it is. For me, no. I'm like, I don't know why it's that difficult. Just believe. It's easier for me to believe that God did it all is to believe that it all just happened. 
And, and if one part of this book's right, it's all right. Amen? So, salvation is, is not complicated. All that is required is faith in Christ. And you, you know, when you're leading somebody to the Lord, that's, if, especially if they're under conviction, I believe that's what, instead of trying to complicate it for them as you pray, and a lot of times, especially the preachers, they try to start throwing scripture here and there, and, and, and you overload people. I just tell people, I said, listen, don't expect the lights to start flickering. Don't expect the walls to start going in and out. It's not going to be the miracle was Jesus died on the cross for you. And three days later, God raised him from the dead. It's our part to believe. And if you believe that and you accept that into your heart, the Bible said in Romans 10, that if you believe with your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, thou shalt be saved. I said, and that's what it takes. And I've seen people that think, oh, they got to be more to it than that. We, they think that there's something on their part more that they have to do. And I, and I try to reiterate that it's already been done. The work has been done. It's finished, as a matter of fact. I said, it's just belief. You've got to believe it. I said, do you believe that Jesus come from heaven, born of a virgin, lived perfect life, died on the cross, and three days later God raised him from the dead? That's what you got to believe. And some people, it settles when you tell them. Because they say, I already believed. I said, then you're already saved based on what Scripture teaches. To believe and confess Him as Lord in your life, you shall be saved. Amen. So I'm thankful that God made it to where it's not complicated. Salvation is not when you break it down like that. Those who trust Christ have assurance of their salvation. And that was the next milestone that I come to after I got saved. Not just being saved, but knowing that I was saved. That was like getting saved all over again. If y'all remember that time that you come to. And now listen, I know Satan will let it creep back in ever, ever so often and you start doubting everything and all of a sudden all your testimony and everything God's done for you is kind of just blank in your stare. But I remember the moment, I remember the night that I got settled on that Then I didn't worry about it. I tried not to worry about it anymore. And and to be honest, up up to that point, I have not as much as I did from that point back. And I was in the bed, middle of the night, God was dealing with me about preaching, and I've told you this story. And I got down in the floor, 2.30 in the morning, Gail was asleep, I was wide awake. I said, God, I can't do this. There's no way I can preach, I don't think I ever got saved. And it's as sure as I'm standing here, it felt like God got a hold of my shirt collar and said, get up. And get back in bed and quit being dumb. I settled that long ago. Just like that. And I thought, okay. And that's what it took for me. That's what it took for me because I said, okay. And that's how I felt. I, like I said, we don't hear him in an audible voice, but if I've ever heard him as clearly as I had then, he said, quit going backwards. You know, almost like he was a little aggravated, perturbed with me that I was doubting that again. That was That, that prayer went up and just, I thought, that, that didn't even feel right to say that. He said, I done settled that in you. Get over it. Move on. It's time now. Quit using that to not go forward is what he was telling me. Boy, people do. Hey, man, so I'm thankful for the reassurance and the assurance of my salvation. I'm sure you are as well. One of the saddest Bible verses is a cry of those not saved in time. Amen. Jeremiah 8, verse number 20 is the ones, those that are not saved in time. Another one is Matthew 7, when Jesus looked at them and they said, have we not cast out devils? Have we not done all these wonderful works? And he says, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. A sad Bible verse. Number two, not only is there still time this year to be saved, there's still time to surrender. Amen. That's a good one. There's still time to surrender. Acts chapter 9, verse number 6. You probably know based on that where we're going. Acts chapter 9, verse number 6 says, And he, talking about Paul, and he trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? That's surrender, ladies and gentlemen. What wilt thou have me to do? Well, let me take it a step farther. That's just mouthing surrender. But Paul.
I mean, if you ask that, God tells you and you don't do it, then you really wasn't surrendered. <clears throat> or if you get up and say, oh, that's too hard. He said, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. You know what? <laughs> I think Paul was wanting long-term uh, notice. And it's something how God only gives you next step details. I mean, he always, trust me, I have to. God, what do you want me to do? I want you to get up. I want you to get your clothes on. I want you to go down there and I want you to preach at church tonight. That ain't, God, that ain't what I ask. I need more detail. He said, just do what I told you to do. the next step. We'll get on it. Don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow's not here yet. Just do the next step. Do the next thing. And that's something that's the way he always does. What did he tell his followers? He told them to get up. Matthew was collecting taxes, had a job. I think it was Matthew. He said, follow me. All right, where are we going? Just come on. I mean, and think about the power. I mean, we preached on that one time. Think about the charisma and the aura and the virtue that he must have had for him to say to a man that has a full-time job, a job that you just couldn't quit like that back in that day, and say, follow me. And he said, okay. Peter and him, follow me. Full-time fisherman. How am I going to feed my family? Just follow me. No details. Just the next step. You know what? That's what's hard with a lot of people. They're like, no, I need more detail than that. Listen, this is God we're talking about. Just trust his next word. That's what he wants. Just trust what he says next. You don't have to know a year down, down the road what to do. You don't have to know, you don't have to know two months down the road what to do. Just know what's next. And you know what? Because I'm gonna tell you what, a lot of people, you couldn't handle it if you knew it anyway. Your perspective changes things. And you're in a place to where God says, I'm gonna only give you what I know you can stand right now. A lot of people, if he, if he would have told me when he called me to preach that he was going to have me a pastor of church, I'd have never signed up. I said, no, I can't do that. Now, I don't care to go preach and do revival every now and then and be able to come back home and not really have no responsibility. I'll do that. But, you know, and at, at first I didn't know that. I was just, I'm, where I'm going to preach next Sunday. But if he had told me all that, and if he had told me all that, just think about if he told you everything you was going to endure to get there. Like Joseph, <laughs> Joseph kind of got a little bit of that when God <clears throat> gave him a dream or he dreamed about all the sheaves and bowing to him, but he didn't see that big valley that he had to go through. Because you know why? If God would have told him all that, he probably said, I, I'm, I'm not up for that. No, because at that time, 17-year-old Joseph is not up for that. But 30 year old Joseph, after he done went through the battles and done went through all that and done got disowned by his whole family, and his father thought he was dead and become second in command to Pharaoh, 30 year old Joseph could handle it. The 17 year old Joseph could not. Same thing with us. Right now, God only gives us, you know, that old saying, and that, or it ain't old saying, the verse, He won't put more on you than you can bear. But don't just go with bad stuff. That goes with, with, with detail on service too, I believe. Because some of us couldn't bear what we think God's going to let us do in the future. Anybody that would sign up, they, they sign up, but then they say, well, okay, what's going to happen down the road? And, and if God told you everything, where you was going to be, even where you was going to arrive, and what you're going to have to go through, 90% of us would say, I, I can't. Because you can't in, the, in who you are right now. But as you grow, and as he takes you from point A to point B to point C, from detail to detail, from step to step, baby step to baby step, somehow, some way, you get there and you thought, I'd have never thought I would be here. Yeah, because back there, you wasn't the same person as you are in the future. 
So that person back there wasn't ready for this yet. But God took you from step to step, point A to point B, hills and valleys, small steps along the way. You, you, you eased into things, and he grew you along the way. He showed you things along the way. See, a lot of people try to get to the destination without learning through the process. And, and the process is how we grow, and the process is what helps others. People say, just get me through this, Lord. It, I say this all the time, and it's one saying that sticks with me. You come through the storm, but what did you leave with? What did you learn through the process of the thunder and lightning? Amen. So there's still time to surrender. The conversation of Saul in the story of a new beginning. He had a new start in his life. What wilt thou have me to do? Saul seemed to have everything, but he had but nothing, but he had nothing. Saul was a persecutor of Christians. He would have thought he was right till his death. But what changed on the road to Damascus took Paul on a whole journey that he would have never believed he would have been capable of doing or stepping into. Saul was trusted, trusted Christ and surrendered completely to him. That's key. This total surrender changed Paul's future and impacted the entire world because of it. Paul called for this kind of surrender for me and you over in the book of Romans chapter 12. There is still time for you to stop resisting God's will for your life. There is time to surrender old habits that hold us back. There is time to surrender a tempter that is destroying our marriages and our relationships. There is time to surrender to God's call to win souls beginning right now, starting tonight. And last but not least, number three, there is still time for the Savior to come this year. Revelation chapter 22, verse number 12, and I'm done. 22.12 says, he said, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. He said, And behold, I come quickly. Well, we look at it now and say, Well, you ain't come yet, Lord, so you ain't come quick. No, but when he comes, it's going to be quick. That's what he's talking about. Christ who died and rose again will come again. A lot of people... They're just hanging out till Jesus comes. So we got to do those first two. He's not here yet, so let's surrender to do what God called us to do next. People say, well, why should I worry about it if he's coming quickly? When he comes, he's going to come quickly. But right now, it's time for us to do the work of the ministry. That's why I don't preach a whole lot on the second coming. Here's why. Because he's going to come when the time's up. But a lot of people, you start preaching it in some Baptist churches and they'll hoop and holler and shout. You know why? Because they don't want to do nothing else. They just want to hang out. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. I've always had a different take on that, and here's what it is. When he comes, all those people we prayed for at prayer request, it's over for them. I'm going to be real honest with you. Listen, this, this world's getting rough. The country's more divided. It, it's tough. I get it. But I hope his mercy keeps enduring because there's people I still want to see saved. If he comes, it's over for them. And then preachers will stand up and they'll hoop and holler and they'll preach about the second coming of the Lord. I'm not saying it's not going to be a wonderful day. It is. It's going to be great for the believer. But I think all those is going to be left behind. I always have. I always have. I don't see the second coming as a great victory. I see the second coming as a sad day for a lot of people. It's going to be a great victory for, for the believer. But what I'm saying is when you stop and think about it and you think about your friends and your loved ones that's not been saved yet, if he come right now, it's over for them. That breaks my heart. That's why I want to do the first two. Surrender to God. Let's do what he calls to do. Let's go to the next step and try to win those to Jesus. Some people may disagree with that take on it, but that's truth. Amen? 
He will come to raise the Christian dead. He will come to catch away Christians to heaven. He will come with rewards for those who have served him. It will be a victorious day, but it will also be a sad day. Christ's coming will take place unexpectedly. He might come tonight, but then again, he might not. So we need to be ready to do what he's called us to do and surrender if you've not to him to do what you can do today for him. Receive Christ today and be sure of heaven. Surrender to Christ today and make this your greatest year coming. Let's bow our heads. Thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to stand tonight and God I pray that for the people in the room the ones that may be watching my Facebook Lord I pray that this is our greatest year coming if you tarry your coming uh, you're not going to tarry you know exactly when it's going to be but if you don't come in the next year two years ten years whenever help us to stay busy Help us to get our head out of the clouds and do what you've called us to do. Help us not just to hang out and use that as an excuse to not do what you want us to do, Lord. I believe for some that's the case. They use that as an excuse just to, just to not surrender, to not do what you called them to do. And God, I pray that we're not like that here at High Ridge. I pray, Lord, that this year coming is the greatest year that this church has ever seen. And I believe anybody would agree with that to know how awesome that would be. Even Brother George that's in heaven now would be awesome if he thought this is the greatest year yet coming. For all of them, for all the ones that, that, that blood, sweat, and tears and prayers for this place, Lord, that's put so much into it, God, we owe that to them to continue on and, and to be surrendered, Lord, and to keep ourselves and our hearts in the right position that we can take the banner and take this and run with it and continue going forward, continue growing your church, continue seeing folks saved. God, I pray and I believe you, Lord, that this is going to be the best year yet. We love you. We praise you. We thank you. We thank you for this past year and all that you've done, even though it ain't over yet, Lord. We get our early start on being thankful for all you've done for us in this past year. We ask you to bless these people. God, I ask you to open the hearts of my people. If they don't know and they're confused, God, I pray that you show them what you want them to do. And if they are doing what you called them to do, that they just keep going strong and doing it. And don't give up and don't stop. Just be consistent in the work of the ministry, of whatever ministry you've called them to. We love you. We praise you and thank you for all that you do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.